Okay, cover crops um, play a really vital role in nutrient supply and it's a pretty exciting time to be involved in working in ag right now because of all of the interest and kind of um, just excitement about cover crops and the role that it might play in terms of providing nutrients, reducing inputs, uh, providing benefits to soil health, and of course um, a lot of it's driven by thinking about water quality issues and how cover the role that cover crops can play in mitigating nutrient losses from fields. So this is a really kind of bare bones overview of cover crops. Uh, we'll have a, this lecture and then another one we'll specifically talk about supply and calculating that or estimating that. Um, and uh, you know we could spend of course a lot lot more time on this <clears throat> um, because there is a lot going on and a lot to discuss. Cover crop uh, is generally um, used to describe something that are seeded and grown but not harvested. Okay, so that's like the, I don't know if the textbook definition, but it's typically something that we're not going to be harvesting and selling, but we might uh, grow that and we might graze it or we might, um, you know, um, we could, I guess, harvest it for forage, but typically when we're talking about cover crops, we're talking about things that we're growing and not harvesting. So it's um, traditionally used to provide soil cover and reduce erosion, but it's really the broader definition, um, it's providing soil cover and a little bit of, of forage if you know if that is able to get grazed if there's if there's livestock in the operation. There's lots of like words, you know, um, catch crops, screen manures, um, thinking about, uh, sometimes they're used interchangeably, sometimes not, but catch crops are typically grasses that are catching nutrients, preventing them from leaching. Green manures are legumes typically that fix nitrogen, provide um, external nitrogen into the system. Um, uh, again, these are used, you know, inter relatively interchangeably. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different things that, you know, um, different verbiage that people use. But, you know, thinking about green manures, um, cover crops, catch crops, uh, these are, co you know, common, common phrases that are, that are thrown out, thrown around. So, why plant cover crops? Well, cover crops do a lot of things, right? And we can quantify them and we can list them here. Uh, there's environmental benefits like increasing soil organic matter, improving structure, increasing nitrogen fertility, suppressing weeds, preventing erosion, protecting waterways, controlling pests, or attracting beneficials. These are all kinds of things that they do from kind of an ecosystem service perspective. Economically, they certainly can reduce fertilizer costs and reduce uh, pests and herbicide costs as well. So. There's a lot of reasons, a lot of benefits that cover crops can provide to farmers and to a farming system. But there's also a lot of challenges and there's also very good reasons why cover crops aren't planted more often and aren't part of a, you know, many grower systems and you know these reasons include there's an additional cost of seed, an additional cost of fuel for planting and terminating or mowing and incorporating. Um, no time, right? There's a lot of issues, uh, particularly in the spring in, a, you know, a state like Ohio where timing planting windows are really critical and yields are really dependent on when crops are, are put in the ground because you, we just have a certain amount of time to, to, you know, to grow a crop. And so, um, when we are bringing something into a system that delays planting of a main cash crop, whether that be an agronomic crop or a vegetable crop, um, you know, that's a challenge and that's a risk that a farmer is incurring. Um, uh, <clears throat> we don't typically have this problem in Ohio, but uh, cover crops aren't used in some places. Uh, California, for, uh, you know, as an example where, or, you know, more lower rainfall states, uh, western parts of the state, because they can actually s suck out too much moisture and not retain enough moisture for that cash crop. So that can be an issue. 
high carbon residue can immobilize soil nitrogen. This is, you know, particularly with grass cover crops uh, that grow might grow really fast in early spring. Uh, might, you know, um, put the farmer at a greater risk of having that cover crop if it's incorporated essentially immobilize nitrogen and quote unquote rob that cash crop, that following cash crop of nitrogen. So, you know, whether it be um, needing additional nitrogen or, or whatever, there's um, there's uh, challenges with this. And then, you know, finally, um, difficult to predict nutrient availability from cover crops. So we know cover crops can be very nutrient rich, but knowing how much of that is actually going to be plant available is challenging. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next next talk. So, uh, specifically, soil fertility benefits to cover crops. Okay, so we talked about benefits broadly, but specifically related to this class, scavenging for nutrients left over from previous crops. This is a really important thing because we're applying nutrients um, and we want to get them used to the, you know as judiciously as possible and so if we can recycle those for the for if we apply nitrogen fertilizer and not all of that is used by that crop we'd love to be able to recycle that immobilize that into cover crop biomass and then have that cover crop biomass essentially decompose the following year and make it available to that that crop in the second year right so um, reduces nutrient loss from erosion and leaching um, we can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere that's a really really large benefit from le legumes in particular storing nutrients for future crops increasing organic matter and then enhancing soil quality and biological activity so these are all things that you know we um, not to say that every single cover crop does all of these things every single time, but in a very general way, cover crops do, you know, provide these benefits, okay? Notice on this list is it increases yields because, you know, not all, not always that's the case. But, um, uh, you know, aside from that bottom line, um, there's a lot of other benefits that, uh, that these cover crops can bring. One of the first things that you know people talk about um, is um, what cover crop should I plant, or you know I'm interested in planting a cover crop. What do you think I should plant? And so much of that depends on the question. You know, what do you want that cover crop to do for you? Like, there's lots and lots of things that cover crops can do, and so the the you know to answer that question of which one should I plant we really need to know what are your goals, right? So what are your goals? What are your production goals uh, for this? And so, um, again, like what, you know, different species of cover crops uh, do different things and have different attributes and some are good at this and bad at that and vice versa. So, you know, just as a, a small example, uh, this table here, thinking about biomass, um, you know, we could produce biomass because we want to increase organic matter, we could produce biomass because we want to actually graze livestock. We could reduce, uh, increase biomass because we want to uh, have a nice thick uh, thatch or mat of crop that uh, reduces weeds. Increasing biomass uh, if we're on like really highly rotable slopes and you know thinking about that. So. Um, or we're maybe we're interested in a cover crop for root penetration of the soil because we want to break up, uh, you know, some kind of hard pan or fragile pan, or we, we just want to increase uh, channels for drainage, increase our soil aggregation structure. We might select a cover crop that flowers because we want um, beneficial insects to come in, okay, for whatever reason. Uh, and we might think about, um, okay, I've got a lot of disease, so I'm going to grow this cover crop as a biofumigant or as a way to suppress pathogens or blah, blah, blah. So, you know, again, cover crops can play multiple roles, and the, the <clears throat> selecting a cover crop really requires that the grower think about and articulate what's the goal, what's the objective of growing this cover crop, what am I trying to get out of it? Okay. 
so what are farmers goals when they plant cover crops this is a survey that um, uh, North Central Sarah conducted um, in the, the Midwest essentially thinking about what are the benefits and so here's um, you know a list and this is essentially a percentage of respondents that listed these uh, benefits so over half of them over half of the respondents uh, these are growers um, said they want a soil compaction reduction um, more than half of them said we want soil erosion reduction okay so again soil conservation benefits uh, nitrogen scavenging weed control increased yields for future crops nitrogen source so like actually an external source of nitrogen that we're growing our own here we're essentially you know mediated through that legume uh, manufacturing nitrogen on our farm fibrous rooting system deep tap roots economic return you know on and on and on so um, there's lots of reasons there and lots of goals that um, farmers have and bring to the table and, you know and sometimes we're like we're like do you want all of these things and of course the answer is yes but you know sometimes we when we're selecting that cover crop have to kind of pick and prioritize um, what we want so I'll just mention briefly uh, two common cover crop rotations in grain um, so <clears throat> it's actually really <laughs> challenging now it used to be uh, maybe 10 or 15 20 years ago it was kind of easy to talk about the cover crops that are being used anymore there's just such a diversity of, of and, and availability of seeds that are out there and what's getting planted it's really hard to kind of put this into a lecture and not just have it be a giant laundry list okay so from a cash grain uh, perspective corn soybean wheat rotation uh, corn is harvested after corn is harvested uh, rye cover crop uh, this is cereal rye would be drilled typically after that corn harvest okay and then that cover crop would be terminated before in the spring before soybean is planted after soybeans plant, uh, planted, grown, and harvested in that second year, uh, winter wheat is sown. Okay, and then, uh, and this is you know common in an organic uh, grain rotation uh, still today. And people, you know, there's this is not not to say this isn't done. This is done very commonly. Cereal rye after corn, and then before soybeans, and then. Wheat's planted in the fall, of course. It's harvested in, say, that summer, maybe around uh, early July. Um, but what happens in, say, March, late March, early April, it's uh, a red clover or some type of clover is frost seeded. That is, uh, it's uh, gone out and just essentially broadcast applied into that soil. That frost action, essentially, that, you know, clover seed's very small, so that, that um, frost action will maybe open and close cracks and clover is able to germinate um, like that so what happens is as that um, small grain whether it be wheat or something else uh, barley for example uh, grows uh, there's a, a clover undercrop there uh, that wheat will you know senesce that canopy opens up and um, the clover essentially fills in a bit the wheat is harvested and then that red clover has from essentially July to the end of the year even longer to grow and uh, produce a lot of biomass fix a lot of nitrogen sometimes this might just be mowed uh, as a nitrogen source to return it to the system sometimes it could be grazed or even uh, baled for baleage for example so there's a number of things that that we could do with that so this is a, a pretty common practice then of course uh, in the, the spring of that fourth year so um, again corn is year one soybeans year two wheat's planted at the end of year two harvested in year three and then at the end of uh, year three we've got all this red clover year four um, again that clover could um, be grazed or 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 or, or hayed, uh, but what what happens at sometime year f uh, four or five is that this clover will get terminated and then corn will plant it into this 
a lot of this nitrogen rich leguminous material and that feeds uh, you know feeds a very valuable nitrogen source for corn so this is very very common say in an organic cash grain, cash grain operation this type of rotation but common quote unquote common cover crops there's a lots out there uh, and, and a lot that you'll see and this is really just just a um, a small list it's certainly there's nothing exhaustive about this list but common grasses are cereal rye, oats annual ryegrass so annual ryegrass and cereal rye are not the same species and they're commonly confused but they're different um, triticale sorghum sudan grass barley there's lots of different grasses that are used legumes popular ones are red clover crimson clover balanza clover sometimes called fixation clover Australia winter pea, um, there's a number of different types of legumes that are out there. You know, alfalfa could be included in that mix as well. Broadleaves, oilseed radish is a really, really popular broadleaf. Buckwheat, another really popular, but there's turnips, sunflowers, mustards, a lot of brassicas in this list. So the rub here is that there's many, many combinations of these and many cocktails, many recipes out there, these cover crop cocktails, okay, where uh, farmers now might be, you know, using two or three different species. They might be using three or four. They might be using ten or twelve. Um, there's a lot of different kind of systems out there, and different people kind of, um, you know, essentially being proponents of a lot of different diversity. And and we'll talk um, later about kind of crop diversity and, and the role that that plays. Um, but it's you know important concepts and thinking of uh, from kind of an ecological perspective these many different species that might exist um, in combination and then have complementarity to them. Okay, so it's like more than the sum of some of their parts. But um, again, it's very difficult for me to kind of um, you know we could talk about things like um, winter pea radish mixes. Sometimes there's oats in there. These kind of two or three mix. Um, that are are very popular and used quite readily. A lot of this has to do, you know, you get into like 10 or 12 different uh, different cover crop seeds. Um, there's a lot of money that can be spent in terms of all that mixing and like selecting a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. A lot of the really common um, mixes that are used, you know, economics drives this because people can spend easily uh, 30 to $50 an acre on cover crop seed. And so, you know, it, it can be a, a big expense, but so often common and, and um, commonly used cover crops are of uh, relatively inexpensive and very, you know, high success rate of establishment for um, One of the things that, um, one of the most important things to understand in terms of cover crops in Ohio context is the difficulty with establishment and the windows that we have. Um, and this is true for grain crops, but also really for kind of cash crops of any sort, uh, whether it be vegetable or, um, or grain. So one of the challenges is that, um, we don't have particularly long growing seasons in Ohio, right? And in a lot of the Midwest or the upper Midwest. And because of that, we, you know, we think about when we're, we're often planting in the state, which is um, sometime around, you know, April at the earliest, usually to some May and early June are really our planting windows. And harvest occurs sometime in September, October, maybe even November. So, Kind of in a, um, for an annual grain crop, if we just plant, say, in the late spring, early summer, and then harvest in the, in the fall, there's um, periods where there's a lot of photosynthesis uh, that could be happening, a lot of sunlight that's falling and not getting captured in the spring and then even in the fall, okay? So one of the challenges is if we plant, say, a cover crop after... Uh, harvest, say we drill seed a cover crop, 
there might just be a little window in the fall that that cover crop can grow but then maybe in the springtime uh it might have a, a you know if it's a if it's a can overwinter then it can have an opportunity to, to make a little produce a little bit more biomass and and provide some more benefit um you know too many times we hear about cover crops that are planted and they just there's just not enough time and they you know get really they grow a little bit but it's you, you know you just don't have that biomass accumulation that growth that you really need in order for it to have a real positive benefit so one of the challenges is is like how do we squeeze these into these planting windows and have it not be a challenge to manage in springtime when planting season is really really difficult and so um, one of the, the issues or one of the ideas uh, different ways that we can think about interseeding or intercropping cover crops into systems to help meet one of these primary challenges okay and so we'll talk a second about intercropping but um, uh, the idea is that you know we get growth some growth before that crop is is harvested and so we have a lot more kind of biomass production um, going into the fall and then because there's more biomass and a greater rooting system established, there's much greater biomass production in the spring. And so when that cover crop is terminated for that cash crop, there's a lot more benefit that comes, a lot more residue, a lot more um, you know, uh, potential nutrient supply coming from that. Okay, So this is a, you know, a major, major challenge. And almost invariably when people say that they don't plant cover crops or they can't do it it's because of the timing that they maybe have tried in the past or it's just like by the time I get everything harvested in the fall and I won't go to plant you know there's like so little time for um, growth to happen okay so to one of the challenges or one of the ways that we can one of the op some of the options for extending the season um, is interseeding and so uh, there's a few different options here with uh, aerial seeding and this is something that's uh, more and more common where uh, crops essentially are sown they're broadcast seeded via airplane over standing crops okay you can do large a lot of acres like this this is primarily done in of course uh, like corn soybean fields um, but we can have you know challenges with that and when we're not uh we're just like essentially blowing seed out of an airplane you know the the spread might not be particularly that even and um the you know you can get very um the chances of success are are variable so if you get rains at a good time uh you can get a really nice stand established but uh sometimes um you don't you know that doesn't happen and so it's a bit hit or miss with the aerial seeding uh, another option that you know farmers don't have to pay a, a pilot to do this they can use uh, high clearance seeding and these are um, essentially some kind of modified uh, boom it might be a you know a, a spray tractor or whatever but there's tubes here that um, air it's an air seeded um, crop this is intended to go in between corn rows so when the corn's tasseled and really tall this can still this high clearance um, applicator can still go through that field and drop cover crop seed um, both the aero seeding and the high clearance seeding would happen typically sometime um, you know after tasseling maybe um, a month or so after tasseling sometimes sometime in in august or early September that might happen um, so these again these are good options to extend that season but they can be variable because at the end of the day you are just laying seed on the soil and we're expecting where we're requiring some rain to happen uh, for that you know to get some seed to soil contact and get germination get a good stand established okay Another option, uh, which is more uh, equipment intensive but potentially better success, is a no-till interseeder. Okay, 
So this is essentially a drill, and that here's a small um, research plot one, but it's a drill that is high clearance, so it can clear corn or you know beans for that matter uh, when that crop is you know fully established um, and or it's still in its early phases, but it's fully established. So the idea is that we don't want to plant corn and then a cover crop at the same time because that cover crop, uh, you know, if we plant them at the same time, uh, we're going to get competition. And, you know, we don't want that because of competition of our, of our cash crop. And so when we delay the planting, we plant corn, come back at, say, V5 or V6, 7, and interseed, we have a drilled seed, which is a much better chance of germination. We're typically going to get much, much better stands if we drill than if we just broadcast seed, okay? So we're planting that seed, and then that seed emerges, and there's a little bit of time before this corn canopy closes and the corn, you know, gets very tall and a lot of light, most of that light reaching that uh, soil is going to be very low light. but. Uh, when we time this right and the conditions are good, we can get in there and, and drill seed in. That cover crop will emerge and kind of not do too much. It will be pretty small still uh, and can, you know, essentially hunker down somewhere between uh, mid-June, late June to sometime in, uh, say, late July, July, late to July. At that point, the corn starts to mature, that canopy starts to open as that corn um, or soybean starts to senesce. And then that cover crop, you know, that was just kind of hunkering down, not doing particularly well, not growing a whole lot because of the lack of light, starts to really, you know, take off. And so this is a kind of a similar idea to the frost seeding of red clover into winter wheat. We can, we can interseed. Um, not just clovers into corn or soybeans, but grasses, you know, mixtures, lots of different things. So this is another option that's available uh, for essentially extending the season and getting better growth because this is a really, really big challenge. You know, we can think about uh, putting cover crops in and just like letting them, letting them grow all year, um, but for many farmers that is not practical to think about taking an entire field out of production or you know many fields out of production um, of, and, and not essentially not harvest anything off that um, like the economics just aren't there they just they cannot simply can't afford to do that so these are ways where we're trying to fit cover crops into the system um, but do it kind of strategically and um, Maybe you know have a little help from some new technologies that are out there. So on the other end of this is planting actually into standing cover crop. Okay, so one of the challenges I'll go back to my slide here. You know, typically what we do is we would terminate this cover crop either you know spray it out or actually till it under or something, depending on the system, and then we would plant a cash crop into that. Okay, um, but if we, you know, if, let's if we think about an organic farmer, they're typically going to be plowing that under. And then you've got to wait, you know, several weeks for that um, for that cover crop to decompose because there could be germination issues. There might just be too much residue to plant into. So there's challenges there. But another thing that's happening, and I don't have, uh, I just have a couple YouTube clips here. I'm gonna, you know, strongly recommend that you that you go and watch these because I think it's. So a lot of nice things. Um, I've, you know, these are both from an organic perspective, but uh, there's a lot of conventional growers that are planting in. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but there's a lot of interest from conventional growers in planting into standing cover crops. So it provides a, um, a, you know. So what does that mean? Well, these videos will explain, but we're essentially talking about using a roller crimper. Um, at, you know, either before planting or soon after planting, that you um, mow down a cover crop, and that cover crop provides a really nice thick uh, mat for weed suppression, for moisture retention, 
but um, allows your you know your crop to your cash crop to grow through that. So um, some really kind of cool stuff, inspiring stuff that people are doing, um, and uh, you know from this idea of organic no-till. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of nice kind of information out there. So, very much an emerging system. But I, I, I encourage you all to to go and check that out. Um, take you a few minutes to kind of get through each one of these links. But there's some nice work that's being done. Okay, then just to wrap up, there's uh, plenty, plenty, plenty of resources out there. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that close to home is this Midwest Cover Crop Council. This is a group that is very active. Um, they have a listserv that you're welcome to join, and um, you know they have a cover crop selector tool, um, a lot of things, uh, a lot of good resources on this website that's hosted by Michigan State, but it's a consortium of many Midwest organizations. And then finally, this um, free download of uh, managing cover crops profitably. So these are both really nice resources to point you to for additional information. A lot to say about cover crops, a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, I'll talk uh, just in the next um, lecture about uh, how do we predict nutrient supply, but um, a lot more that we could say.